Okay, last class we left off and we've been talking about recovery, recrystallization, and grain go growth. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that before we move on. So first off, uh, we know that plastic deformation is going to increase the number of dislocations, it's going to change the shape and orientation of our grains, and it's going to strain harden us, right? So by deforming it, introducing all these dislocations, you're making it so that in your material you've got all these dislocations, which remember on average repel another, so that this dislocation is now, it's very difficult for this dislocation to move its way through the material because it's feeling this repulsive force from all those other ones. And then the change in the grain shape means that dislocations are also getting pinned at grain boundaries, right? So let's talk about what happens when you take that thing, the blacksmith has been pounding on it, you've been sending it through the cot roller, right? Whatever it is, but now you're gonna heat it back up. What occurs, right? The first thing that's gonna happen uh, during this annealing or heat treatment process is recovery. In recovery, the internal strain is relieved by dislocation motion, right? So again, of all these dislocations, these things might be able to rearrange themselves, right? This thing might be able to flip itself around, right? These two, these two might be able to combine and annihilate themselves, right? Thereby reducing the density of dislocations. And earlier this chapter, we talked about how many dislocations there are per square millimeter, for example. And after you anneal it, the number goes down because they're able to move around, find each other, and get rid of one another, right? Um, however, there can also be something happens which is called recrystallization. And this is when new strain-free grains grow, and these have a, a far lower dislocation density than the heavily cold worked ones. Moreover, these grains are now equiaxed, so that they're roughly the same dimension, uh, dimension in all directions rather than being aligned. So for example, if you cold roll something, your grains are going to start to stack up and be very uh, isotropically aligned. But after equiaxed, they're going to now be more regular shaped, right? All right. The, what important things to know during recrystallization is that they grow out of the parent grain and that you typically see a restoration of your mechanical properties to the pre-cold worked values. So if you really want to reset something in terms of hardness, strength, ductility, uh, recrystallization can achieve it, right? The recrystallization temperature occurs typically around a third to a half of the melting point. So for aluminum that melts around six or 600 degrees or so, you could be observing recrystallization, you know, a factor of two or three below that, right? Um, and so here's a plot basically showing what's happening. Um, this is your grain size. Um, let's see, grain size should actually, oh, it, okay, here you're plotting grain size, ductility, strength, and hardness, right? So as you cold work it, grain size goes down, as grain size go down, goes down, hardness goes up, strength goes up, your ductility goes down though, right? Now, when you heat treat this, those things start to go in reverse. At first, when you heat treat it and you're doing the recovery phase, you're not seeing a lot of grain growth. It's pretty flat because you need higher temperatures for that. You're seeing a slight improvement in your ductility and a slight improvement in your strength even because you're getting rid of that, getting rid of those initial flaws, but it's not changing very much. During recrystallization, that's when you see a real drop in your strength because you're getting rid of the dislocations. So with them no longer pinned, you lose strength, but you make up for it by picking up in, in your ductility, right? And so that's the process of recrystallization uh, and recovery and grain growth, okay? So grain growth we talked about last time. It's driven by reducing the surface energy, right? Uh, I think the TAs will show you a video on how it's ruining your ice cream. And again, this is the basic equation that it follows. So once you know D naught and K for a given material, then you could uh, estimate how grains will grow if you were to change the time, right? If you, if you know how they grow at a certain temperature for a certain material, then you could say, all right, after 10 hours from some initial size, what will the final grain size be? And if you know the grain size change, you can go back to your Hall-Petch equation right here. If you know your final grain size, you could calculate a new yield strength so you can see how that will change, okay? So that is that process. Let's shift gears from metals now and talk about ceramics. So can ceramics deform? We know that they, they don't really deform. They have a very, very little tolerance for plastic deformation. So that said, deformation could still technically happen via dislocation motion, but what oftentimes happens is that instead of that happening, it's simply lower energy for fracture to occur, right? Therefore, it becomes more common. And the reason that, it's, that this is more commonly occurring has to do with the structure of ceramics. Let's take a look at this one. Let's zoom in, right? If you look at what's happening in the ceramic structure, take a plane, say like this one here. That's a high uh, density plane. You might expect 
well, why, if you're pulling on this thing, you know, on the top and bottom, why won't it just shear in that direction and this direction like it would do with a single crystal? The challenge, though, is that if it was going to shear, as these atoms slide upwards, then you're going to see that this scenario is going to have to happen. The negatives are going to have to slide past the negatives. Positives are going to have to slide past positives, negative and negative, positive and positive. So you're going to generate extremely large electrostatic repulsions, right? And because of that, you're going to have to cost so much energy in terms of uh, electrostatic repulsion that it's cheaper in terms of energy to just fracture and create two new surfaces that have a surface energy associated with them. And that's why most of the time ceramics don't do uh, much plastic deformation because it, it, it's too energetically expensive for them. There's other reasons. Um, the covalent bonds found in ceramics are also very strong. Um, they're not typically like the FCC metals, right, that have a ton of slip systems. They have lower numbers of slip systems. And the dislocations are not as trivial as the ones we saw with metals, where it's just the extra half row um, slid in there. They can be more complex uh, dislocation structures. All right, what about glasses? We know that glass can deform, particularly when you heat it up. At room temperature, it's not very, uh, you can't, it, it's like a, like a ceramic in that it won't be um, plastically deforming. But at high temperatures, you can start to see significant deformation. And it's typically due to viscous flow, right? The material literally just flows past one another, right? So we need to introduce the concept of viscosity. We've talked about it before. Let's spend a little more time on it. Viscosity is a measure of a non-crystalline materials resistance to deformation, right? So if this plate up here, it's moving at some velocity u. The bottom plate is fixed. The liquid in between, this disordered material in between, the stuff really close to the top plate is going to be going at the same speed as u. And the stuff, the liquid right at the bottom is going to be basically at zero, right? So this gradient in velocity, du dy, that gradient, that is what we use to calculate uh, the viscosity, right? The viscosity is equal to the shear stress, force over area, divided by that gradient in the, 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 the velocity of that fluid, right? From that, you calculate viscosity. The units are pascals times second. And this is important. We have arbitrarily chosen to define the glassy transition temperature as what the temperature when the viscosity is equal to 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. So why they chose 10 to the 12 pascal seconds? Basically because it's right around the top of our glassy transition curve, right? So in the glassy transition curve, it looked a bit like this, where if you were to plot viscosity, um, right around there, 10 to the 12th, um, that's about when it's dropping off from a, a brittle material to a rubbery plateau and eventually to a flowing material. So this is right around the point of your 10 to the 12th pascal seconds, and therefore we define it as Tg, the glassy transition temperature. However, we can calculate viscosity at any temperature. Um, there are some standard relationships. Some of them work better than others. One of the standard one is the WLF equation, named after Wilhelm, Landell, and Ferry. It's given here. So the viscosity at any temperature is equal to the viscosity at the glassy transition temperature. That's just 10 to the 12 pascal seconds, multiplied by exponential of the whole quantity, negative 17.4, times the temperature of interest minus the glassy transition, 51.6 plus T minus the glassy transition temperature, right? So technically these values, the negative 17.4 and the 51.6, those should be determined for each material. And this is just an approximation, right? It's an approximation to tell you roughly what your viscosity will be as you move um, away from the glassy transition temperature above or below. Okay, some typical values. You can have water which has a very low viscosity, right? 10 to the negative third pascal seconds. You can have thick oil, which is 10 to the negative one pascal seconds. Um, and then you can have glasses above their, you know, sorry, below their glassy transition temperature when they're behaving as a brittle ceramic. And those could be 10 to the 17th or 18th pascal seconds, right? So there's some typical values. All right, what about, so that's ceramics and glasses, how they deform. Let's switch gears and talk about polymers. How is it that they deform and how can we strengthen them? So recall that many polymers are semi-crystalline. They're not entirely crystalline. They have regions that are crystalline, um, and then they have amorphous regions between those crystalline regions, right? So in these pictures, you can see this. Let me zoom in on this. In this picture, you've got the crystalline region. And then you've got these amorphous regions. So if you were to pull on this polymer, the very first thing that you're going to observe 
is that the amorphous region will stretch out. Right? They're going to elongate. And then if you keep on pulling on it, you're going to see a tilting of the lamellar chains relative to the direction, right? They used to be tainted, tilted uh, before like this. Now they're tilted like that. After that, you're going to see the breaking up of these crystalline regions. And finally, you see some real separation into different block chains, right? So that's sort of the process whereby you see um, deformation occurring in polymers, right? The different steps that are involved. And basically what's happening is you went from the spherulite, which was the mixture of the crystalline and the amorphous regions, and you destroyed it, right? You destroyed it during plastic deformation. Now, because you destroyed it, you've changed the entropy and the enthalpy of this system. And if you reheat it, then you can restore the spherulites, right? It can go from this back to a crystalline region, an amorphous region, a crystalline region, an amorphous region, right? To some degree, you're gonna be able to restore that. And as you restore that, you're going to change the mechanical properties. For example, imagine the difference in strength between the first sample and this final sample. In this first sample, you could deform it pretty easily because there is this elongation, there's the tilting, all of that could happen easily. By the time you get to this final point here, when you keep on pulling on it, now you're starting to break covalent bonds. So it's much harder, right? Stronger, it's stiffer at this point than when it was when it started. Therefore, when you heat it back up, you're typically going to re restore some of those properties, right? Something interesting that happens with polymers um, is stress relaxation. This is really important. The stress at any given time can be calculated from some initial stress multiplied by your exponential of the negative Young's modulus times time divided by the viscosity. In other words, uh, you can look at how stress changes over time. You might expect um, if you plot against time, stress, that it's going to be constant for material. But in fact, rather than being constant, you might see a slow decay, right? And so that's what happens in polymers. We can actually calculate that. So this question that we're going to work together is the following. At the glassy transition temperature, and remember, at the glassy transition temperature, that's when your, your viscosity is equal to 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds. You observe that a stress of 100 megapascals produces 10% strain. What does stress decay to after two minutes? Give your answer in megapascals with one decimal place, right? So you've heated this up all the way to its glassy transition temperature. It's starting to begin to look more like a, uh, a material that has rubbery characteristics, right? So go ahead and give this a shot with the TAs. I'll pause it and then you can see if we get the same answer. Okay, so again, to do this, the only thing that we need to do before we plug it into this equation is figure out what the modulus is. We're told that initially a stress of 100 megapascals produces 10% strain. So we can use that. We know that stress equals strain um, times, sorry, stress equals modulus times strain. Or solving for modulus, it's stress over strain. So 100 megapascals divided by 0.1, that's 10%, gives us our 1 gigapascals or 1,000 megapascals for the modulus. Then we just have to plug things in, and I find that the stress after two minutes in this material at this temperature has already dropped from 100 megapascals to 88.7 megapascals. So if you needed this to be load-bearing or something and you take it up to that high temperature, you might have a scenario where it significantly uh, reduces its, its stress. Therefore, it's basically straining, it's stretching uh, this polymer. And so that, that could be something that produces very undesirable results depending on the application. All right. What can happen as you change things like molecular weight? The modulus generally is not as effective as heavily. The tensile strength will increase though uh, because the molecular weight increases. That means that longer chains are going to be lined up a little bit better, right? The more that the longer your chains, the better your odds of you getting these nice alignment and that leads to stronger van der Waals second, secondary bonding as well as better entanglement. Now degree of crystallinity. If you have a polymer that is totally spaghetti, right? Versus crystalline like that. Secondary bonding definitely increases as you go towards more crystalline regions. Uh, therefore, your modulus will, will increase with crystallinity, and your tensile strength will as well. Uh, but it also becomes more brittle uh, because your modulus increases. So here's a, a helpful plot with looking at this. If you were to plot um, percent crystallinity, and you plot that against the molecular weight, say from like 500, and maybe up to 5k, here you've got maybe 20k, 
40k and so forth, right? All the way up to maybe a million. You see roughly this sort of behavior, right? Down here, you're going to have your greasy liquids. There's a better drawing in the book if you want to see this. But in this region, you're going to have your soft waxes. So as you increase crystallinity, it goes from a greasy liquid to a wax. Then as you now start to increase the uh, molecular weight a little bit, you can have your brittle waxes. It becomes very crystalline. If it's not quite as crystalline, you've got here your tough waxes. Right? Going to higher molecular weight still, here's where you get your hard and soft plastics. Things like that you see bottles made out of and whatnot. Right? Typically have pretty high molecular weights. Right? All right, let's talk about uh, deformation in polymers a little bit more. So you can do pre-deformation by drawing. So you start out with a molten vat of your uh, polymers, right? You can then grab part of it, like you saw in the video with the nylon, when they pulled the nylon out and wound it around the rod. This is called drawing, and this is analogous to strain hardening, right? It strengthens and it stiffens fibers and films. And the reason it does so is it breaks up the sclerolites and it aligns them along their direction, right? So these highly oriented polymers, that's creating anisotropic properties for one thing, right? Much stronger in one direction than another, right? But they're beginning, they're getting stronger and stiffer in this process, right? Um, so if drawn at high temperatures, they can be quenched and you can sort of retain these properties down to low temperatures by quenching them, which is just cooling them down quickly, right? However, if you do heat treatment, you will cause them to go from that aligned regions back to your spherolites, right? And if you're undrawn and then you heat it, you might actually increase the ductility, right? So this is the opposite effect of metals. I'm going to leave the TAs to discuss this. And then drawn polymers have the opposite effect, right? So if you have an undrawn polymer, you heat it up, the modulus and the yield strength both increase, ductility decreases, drawn polymers have the opposite effect. So you can discuss that with the TAs. All right, deformation of elastomers. Unstressed elastomer is amorphous, coiled, twisted, and kinked, right? Now, when you start to stretch it, you're undoing that. You're pulling these fibers, but remember, there's these covalent bonds, so you've got these sort of spaghetti noodles, and occasionally, they've got something cross-linking them. Maybe it's like a sulfur atom, right? Linking those chains together. So as you start to pull them, eventually, you're gonna to start to pull on the covalent bonds in those cross-links, right? So that's what causes it to, to want to spring back eventually, right? Um, some things to remember about polymers, right? Um, to be a polymer, you cannot be totally crystalline. Your chains need to be able to rotate a little bit freely. Um, you get plastic deformations delayed. That's via, that's via the restriction of the chains due to cross-linking. And uh, your temperature is going to be below your, above your blasted transition temperature there. All right, we've already talked about vulcanization, which is introducing these groups to cause cross-linking. Okay, so that is the rest of this chapter. We'll now move on to chapter six, which is diffusion.